Before I was a Unitarian Universalist minister, I was a social justice organizer. I worked at all levels, from grassroots to international, and on different issues from gender to climate to weapons. And at every level, on every issue, I saw activists struggling, struggling to maintain their own well-being in very serious ways, even to the point of struggling with their health and the well-being of their souls. I struggled too. I faced burnout. I watched close friends and colleagues suffer major health consequences, and I saw our movements turn on each other. We spent precious energy fighting each other instead of systems of oppression, fighting over political disagreements or money or power. After leaving an organization I loved due to political infighting, I finally hit a wall in 2009. A climate policy bill that had finally b brought the big green groups together with the smaller environmental organizations and the economic and racial justice organizations collapsed. Every organizer that I knew on Capitol Hill and many organizations were having an existential crisis. It wasn't just that we had lost a major battle. It was that we felt like hope was lost. The movement leaders were in disarray and everyone was disagreeing on the next strategy. People that I knew and loved were saying things like, that was our last great hope for preventing climate change. I found my own grief about climate change was getting mixed in with deep disillusionment, both about the political system and the capacity for the treetops to change it. That pain was even touching my faith in humanity's goodness and my belief in hope. My soul was in trouble. Studies have shown that somewhere between 10 and 70% of activists experience burnout, and 50 to 60% leave the work and never come back. Of course, people are trying to address this, but, much, but like much of our society, they are focusing on individual solutions for well-being. Dr. Paul Gorski, who's an academician who has studied burnout in activists, said, so much of the conversation is about not burning out is built around the idea of self-care. A lot of it is asking the question, what are people doing to survive these conditions within movements? Maybe you guys have heard some of this self-care talk. It's like, take a bath. Have a hot chocolate. Have you gone for a walk today? Gorski continues, what people should really be talking about is how to address those conditions institutionally. How can leaders do this? How can leaders and institutions get better at community care? How do we attend to one another's well-being? while also attending to the cause. When I hit my own wall of burnout, I sought support. I found myself going to the Unitarian Universalist Church down the street from my house in Washington, D.C. every Sunday. I reached out to friends and mentors, and while I did not want to leave the work of justice, I found myself longing, needing, to do it differently. I wanted to intentionally care for my soul and the souls of other people as part of the work. Recently, I watched a beautiful conversation between authors and social justice activists Hala Alyan and Adrian Marie Brown in which they attended to one another and to other activists struggling with pain and grief from witnessing the ongoing devastation and civilian death in Gaza. 
In that conversation, Alian talked about organizing a gathering for other justice organizers so that they could get together and weep. She said that she had initially organized that gathering for other people, thinking, okay, other people need this, so I'm going to create the space for it. But when all of these justice organizers finally got together at her house in this safe space and container that she created, that they could just be and feel with one another, she said that no one was crying harder than she was. She thought she was doing the work for other people, doing the justice work, and she found that her own soul needed it as much as anyone. Later on in that conversation, Alian and Brown stopped talking about the issues and they just did some breathing together, inviting the viewers to join them in attending to our nervous systems, in being present to our bodies and feeling. Wisconsin has more than 800 miles of Great Lakes shoreline. About half of those are on Lake Superior up north, and the other half are on our beloved Lake Michigan, just a couple blocks east of here. Ecosystems that live at the edge of two systems, the shoreline between water and land, for instance, contain rich and diverse and unique habitats. According to the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Lake Michigan's diverse aquatic and nearshore habitats include sandy beaches, majestic dunes, coastal forests, marshes, and ridge and swale complexes. All of these contain habitats and plants and animals that are found nowhere else on Earth. The Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin says that, quote, more than 130 rare wildlife species live in the coastal Lake Michigan habitat. This includes Blanchard's cricket frog, and Blanding's turtle, and Henslow's sparrow, and the cerulean warbler, and the bird of the beaches, that federally endang endangered piping plover. The shoreline where our lake meets our land is rich in rare wildlife because the meeting and mingling of two different environments, deep, moving, fresh water, and wild, fertile land produce a third system a third system where species arrive specific to the location of their meeting, that specific mingling, the productive third space of learning and adapting and flourishing. When we say justice is an issue of faith, we are standing at the shoreline of multiple minglings, which leads to more flourishing. First, there is justice and there is faith. The practices of making the world more equitable and the practices of the spirit. The overlap of these two is the thriving shoreline, home to the cerulean warbler and the cricket frog. Here, with our feet in wet stand, we do the work of justice as spiritual practice, with care for the soul braided into it. Not a separate thing that we do somewhere else, but that care for the soul is inside the work of justice. In our first church, social justice teams, new, plan, new teams plan not only their purpose and strategies and actions, but they also plan their spiritual practices and talk about how they are connecting with Unitarian Universalist theology and values. Care for the soul 
is a necessary and important component of the well-being and retention of activists and also of healthy working relationships in justice work and of recruitment and growth in movements. And all of that means that care for the soul is necessary to the su success of justice work. At church, we do the work of social justice as faith work with deliberate attention to that care, connecting our values and our theology by practicing healthy relationships. Relationships are central to the work of justice. Brian Stevenson, the public interest lawyer and executive director of Equal Justice Initiative and the best-selling author of Just Mercy, writes, I think sometimes when you're trying to do justice work, when you're trying to make a difference, when you're trying to change the world, the thing that you need to do actually is get close. Get close enough to people who are falling down, people who are suffering, close enough to people who are in pain, who have been discarded and disfavored, to wrap your arms around them and affirm their humanity and their dignity. Stevenson says, we cannot make progress in creating a more just society and healthier communities if we allow ourselves to be disconnected from the people who are the most vulnerable from the poor, the neglected, the incarcerated, the condemned. If you're trying to make policies in the criminal justice space but have never met someone who's in jail or in prison, if you haven't been to jail or prison yourself, you're going to fail. Our Unitarian Universalist faith rests on right relationship. Our theology of liberating love calls us to be in right relationship with ourselves and our neighbors and the world. Justice work is the practice of that theology, the practice of being in right relationship. In order to practice though, y'all, we gotta get in relationship. It's required for the practice. It's not enough to examine relationship and think about relationship and theorize what rightness in relationship would look like. We have to get in relationship, be in relationship in order to practice it. And that's a lot harder. It's a lot messier, it's a lot more confusing, it's a lot more human than reading a book and becoming an expert on right relationship. Two weeks ago, our First Church anti-racism team went to the table to serve lunch during Beloved Community Day for Martin Luther King Day. Venus Williams gave us a tour of the facility showing us how each of the ministries at the table deepens relationship cultivating vocation while also serving community members. It is a vibrant, thriving black-led space that serves needs in the community and also elevates and supports the black leaders and practitioners who are providing the service. During the tour, Venus told us that all kinds of congregations are interested in financially supporting the table's work but that they are not interested in money alone. Williams said, people are really surprised when we say no to partnerships that are only based on money. Our partnerships prioritize relationship. If you just want to give us money, we'll say no. You need to get into relationship with us, deep relationship of six months at least in order for us to know one another and become partners before we will accept a financial donation. In the work of justice, we need to keep remembering how to overlap theory and practice. 
It's not just ideas or knowledge about the right way or right relationship or what is just, but the practice of moving towards that, practicing in relationship. This is the second mingling at the shoreline. When we do this well, when we combine theory and practice, when we combine care for the soul with justice work in the world, we create that vibrant and rare shoreline ecosystem teeming with life and creativity. The rich intersection of relationship is where those rare birds, lifelong activists in the service of love, are bred. Studies have shown that people who dedicate their lives to activism have been nurtured and supported by other community leaders. People stay in the work when they're embedded in relationship, embedded in communities that care for and have the opportunity and the practice of not only caring for their own souls, but encouraging others and being encouraged by others to keep caring for all of our souls. That vibrant shoreline, it's teeming with varieties of life. That's part of what makes it un unique and thriving. There are different paths into the work of justice as a faith issue. We can free ourselves and open ourselves to our own flourishing within the faith and justice ecosystem when we realize that our rare gifts are part of the liveliness of the place. Black liberation theology author Cole Arthur Riley writes, it can only make our journey towards justice more robust more beautiful when we offer a diversity of paths, a more expansive vision of action. This is Detour and Hiero Viega's graffiti art, resurrecting black faces slain by the police. This is Trisha Hersey and the Knapp Ministry creating collective sleeping experiences to reclaim the justice and liberation in rest. If writing is a calling, I, Cole Arthur Riley, have a responsibility to demand justice in my writing as much as in the streets. When we expand our imaginations for activism, we enter into practices of lament and rage with more particularity, and we begin to realize more nuanced and diverse paths into the work of justice. At First Church, we have so many faith in action, justice is a faith issue teams coming at justice from their place of practice. We have common ground literacy tours doing the deep relational work of one-on-one -on -one tut tutoring with a child in Milwaukee. We have interfaith doing the tricky and complex relational work of showing up in love for our Jewish and our Muslim siblings in Milwaukee. We have teams of people cooking food for the guests at Guest House and serving the guests at Interchange Food Pantry. And we also have people doing their own deep faith and justice work, getting right in their families of origin or claiming authentic identities for the first time or healing ancestral wounds that have been carried for too long or making just choices in their workplaces, or doing deep meditation practices for all of humanity. Our Unitarian Universalist faith is about being in right relationship with all of creation. Justice is the practice of that theology in a specific place through the window of the gifts of our own souls. Here at that shoreline, between the life-giving fresh water of spiritual practice and the concrete life-sustaining fertile land of justice, we attend to relationship.
caring for our own souls as well as the souls of everyone we work with. The outcome, the ends, that eschatological horizon that we dream of mutual flourishing in lives of depth and meaning and joy, that is embedded in the means we use to get there, our practice. This is what keeps people coming back. It's what keeps us coming back to the duty of Takun Olom to repair the world, including repairing ourselves. It keeps us coming back because it nourishes us. That is the work of repair. It nourishes and sustains all that is, even the tiniest shards of our hearts and the tiniest shards of the world, helping them find their way back home to the wholeness of that horizon. May it be so, and amen. <laughs>